Yeah. You guys were movie stars practically at some point. We were. Well, you were in a lot of ways, you know? Actually, we were. I remember hearing the stories even from Vince, Spilatro's kid, how he would go places. He drops the name and... Get anything you want. Yeah. Just open up doors. When I got married, my wedding was comped in the Stardust and the Moby Dick room. Comped! You know, I mean, I didn't know they were going to comp it. I mean, if I would have known then, I would have invited 50 more people. <laughs> 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 um, culinary Union, why weren't you, you weren't in that video that day. Well, there was a reason why I wasn't in that video, because Tony thought it best me not to be in that video because of, of the heat that I had on me and my crew, and it would only cause more heat to the election, so it was best that I stay out of it. Man, that was a bad move. Oh, it was a terrible move. It was the, I remember every day of it. At the meetings in the in the My Place Lounge and Tony directing everybody on what they should do and you know. And I said, What do you want me to do? And he said, No, you gotta stay out of this one. He says, because if you're in this, he says, Boy, with all the heat you got on you, he says, Don't know right away, you know. It's okay. <laughs> that was it, yeah, that was that was crazy. But they didn't want to lose it, you know. They didn't want to lose the culinary union then. That was if, if they didn't lose the car, it was a good to have, you know. It was yeah, great it was for nice. everybody, you know, the people, the public in, in general. They didn't realize what they lost when they lost us in that. That's the true. How do you mean? Well, they would have gotten more. I mean, when we were behind them, we were more generous. You know, there was more flexibility into the whole organization. Their jobs, they had better job security. They would have had better dental or whatever it is, you know. We would have made all of them things work. But, you People mean, resisted. Having, having you behind them gave them a little edge in the negotiations? Exactly. Most naturally. Because they know that they got power behind them, you know. Uh, but they, they messed up. The people messed up on that one. You know, so what could you do? Anytime you guys are ready. Frank, let's start this way. Your life since that period, what's it been like? What's it been like? Well, it's been peaceful. It's been quiet. Uh, and I must say it's been different. And uh, I do enjoy my life the way it is now. And uh, it's great life. Got to be, sometimes you think to yourself, boy, this is a lot more boring than the old days. Well, it is much more boring than the old days. Uh, the people I meet now are much different than the people I grew up with. Uh, they're not as exciting. Uh, the nightlife is gone. You more, I more or less live a square type of life, but there's less pressure on my mind now. I don't have any headaches anymore. It's a lot safer. A lot safer. I don't look through my view mirror anymore, unless I'm looking for a policeman because I'm speeding. Other than that, I don't look through my view mirror. When you, uh, when you became a witness, you entered the witness protection program for a time? Yeah, for about, uh, I'd say for about two and a half years, I was in it. A witness protection program. How what would describe your life then? They give you an identity? Well they yeah they give you an identity. Uh, they uh, really don't give you nothing but a birth certificate. You have to achieve your own driver's license. Uh, they give you a social security number and uh, they put you in a motel room. They give you uh, a few thousand dollars for the month's rent in the motel room and uh, they don't give you no employment. You have to find your own job. And if you're having that difficult of a time, uh, then they will go in and talk to the owner of the place. But who wants the owner of the place to know who you are? So that's out of the question. Now try and get an apartment with no past is like, come on, a 45, 50 year old man coming out of the space look, with no background, gonna find an apartment to live in, you know. So, so it's not like they, uh, here, here's your new name, here's your job, here's your house. That, that, that's only in movies. It just don't happen that way. It's it's hard, it's really hard. And you, uh, you know, I mean, the money, they give you a lot of money, not a lot of money. They give you enough to get on, they, they'll let you buy a car for about 2000 They give you about 3500 for for uh, furniture. And if you can't get in an apartment, well, uh, because you have no uh, credit history, uh, they'll give you an extra month's rent so you can more or less buy the landlord to get you in there. But it, it's very difficult, very difficult. And what was the security like for you? I mean, in that two and a half year period, you were you had to be worried about people coming Well, to 
Actually, well, I thought about it, but you know, you're your own worst enemy. You get yourself killed if you reach out for people that you hung with, or you're not, you don't even get a hold of your family. You don't send pictures to nobody. You don't send letters. You don't. Do, you just lose all contact with with your family, and uh, they really don't give you any protection. They don't watch you, or you know, they tell you, "We're putting you here. If you get yourself killed, you got yourself killed." So, you know, you learn to be careful. You have to worry about your family, if you have a family with you, that they don't do anything wrong to jeopardize all of your lives, you know. And that's probably a, a big strain right there, you know, because you're uprooting your family if you have one with you, and they have to change their lifestyle too. And they move you around? Well, if I was moved around several times, uh, probably, I don't know, four or five times, four different states. And especially when you wind, wind up in the south, if you wind up in the South, do I sound like I'm from the South? You know, you know, we talk different. I talk different. And people look at me like, where'd you come from? So you become a good liar, you know. You have to lie in order to blend in with these people. And uh, you have to remember what you lied. What did well, you tell them? Oh, I told them that uh, I'm here because uh, if I was alone and I didn't have my wife with me, let's say I'd say, well, my wife passed away and I had to get away from where I used to live to get away from the memories. Uh, what happened to your, you have a mother and father, oh, they passed away many years ago, and uh, stuff like that. You, know, you just keep on lying. Um, without being too specific, you don't want to give anything away, what, how did you get out of the program, then what is life like? And did, did you well, leave it voluntarily? Was your I idea? left, no, I, I left, as soon as I got out, see, I was on, pro, they had me on uh, probation while I was on there, and as soon as my probation ran out, uh, what I did, see, they, they, they gave us $1,000 a month. They gave me $1,000 a month to live on. So that's no money. After I start thinking about it, this is crazy. I can't make a living here. This is, you know, I got to get out of this. So what I'd done was I wrote a letter to the U.S. Marshal that was in charge of me at the time. And I sent it to his P.O. box. And I told him that I was out of here. And by the time he received this letter, I'd be long gone. And uh, he could have uh, the identity and everything. I was on my own. And I sent the letter out and I loaded the car and gone. I was gone. I left everything behind. And I never heard from them since. <laughs> what did you do? Did you uh, just st basically started a life? On I started my, on a life on my own again. And uh, I moved to one, about three other different states until I uh, settled in at another place that I'm presently at. and. Uh, I'm doing well. Now I'm doing well. Not a business? I have a, yes I do. Okay. You don't want to get too much No, I have a good business. Uh, got your family with you? No. Okay. Um, would you do it again? Would I do what again? Enter the pro program? Not the program. The program is pretty rough. Uh, you know, it's pretty rough on you and your family. Uh, you, you could do it better yourself. I mean, they help you financially, but I don't know. Uh, I mean, if you want to survive, you're going to survive without their help. Would I do it again as far as rolling goes? Uh, it depends on the circumstances. Let's put it like that. If I, uh, I felt my life was in danger, I felt that my best friend was going to kill me, have me killed, that's why I rolled. Otherwise, fear of jail, absolutely not. Jail doesn't scare me. It's free room and board. Tony made a mistake, in, in, and his guys made a mistake in assuming that you were going to rat him out. When you say, what do you mean made a mistake in assuming? Well, they, they, I guess they, they put out a contract on you. They were talking well, that, about that contract wasn't put out, out on me because they thought I was going to roll. That contract was put out on me because he thought he was getting a lot of heat for all the commotion that we were causing in Las Vegas. And in order to get out from underneath all this pressure, he blamed me. So he told our people in Chicago that I was a maniac, I was out of control, I was killing everybody, muscling everybody, and robbing anything that wasn't even nailed down, I was robbing stuff. And he laid it all off on me to get the heat off of him. And, 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 and some murders he did that. He said that I did it on my own without his uh, orders. So, Which was all... It's all bullshit. It was him that was out of control. He was definitely out of control. The man had lost his mind from all the pressure. 
He had a lot of pressure, a lot of heat, and uh, he just just had too much pressure on him. Let's let's start with you and Tony. When you first knew each other as kids, met Tony probably when anywhere between uh, twelve and fourteen years of age. Uh, we were kids, and we uh, both shined shoes. We were shoe shine boys. We carried our little boxes. He was on one side of the street, I was on the other. We were in each other's territory. We met in the middle of the street. We got into a confrontation. He told me if I was here next week, he was going to break my head. I told uh, We pushed each other. We grabbed each other. He left. And uh, I was back on the street the next day. I seen him a week later. And uh, he walked up to me with a shoe shine box and told me that. Uh, you know, uh, I mentioned your name to my brother, and my father heard me mention the last name, and my father said to find out if your father was Joe. And, and uh, is your father's name Joe? And I said, yeah. He said, well, your father saved my father's life, and so we need to be friends. And from that day on, we were partners. Well, not partners, we were friends. Did you, and you know, a lot of this has been written about Tony Spilatro in those days, and he entered a life of crime and was a real bad guy. Was uh, Is that true, and were you a part of that? Yes, I was. I definitely was a part of that. When I, well, I was in jail for a few of them years, but when I got out, we hooked the right up. We hooked up again. But Tony wanted to be, <clears throat> actually at the time, I was satisfied with just robbing, <coughs> uh, burglary, armed robbery, whatever. And Tony wanted to be a syndicate guy. And at the time, I didn't feel like I wanted to share my money with anybody but myself. And then as time grew on, went past, uh, I decided that I would, you know, join him. So I joined him and then I started working for him, actually. I was like his main guy. How does somebody decide to be a syndicate guy? Meaning it's you know, that the role models in the neighborhood are syndicate well, guys? Well, yeah. you, you grow up as a kid from where I'm, you know, from where I'm from. And these people have been around when you were born. So you just grow up there and you see them and you sort of look up to them. They dress nice, they drive nice cars, they have a limited, unlimited amount of money that they're showing you. And these are things that you want to, you know, you want to have, you want to be part of. And uh, I guess that's what drew me into it. And the feeling of power you have over people, you really do have a lot of people that follow you once you're in this type of. Uh, business. So how do you go about it? You don't have to. It's word them out. People just naturally start talking about you. You may have a fight with somebody on the street. Uh, you might break somebody's head in a lounge. You might, the word might get out that you whack somebody in the head and, and this guy's dangerous and somebody you need to know, somebody you want to be around, you'd rather have him as your friend than your enemy, stuff like that. Uh, stories about Tony, the, the, the stare, the death stare, that he was a, a cold dangerous, tough guy. Tony was a tough guy and he did have a, he had a good stare. And uh, I never seen, never done that with me. But I've seen him do it with people. I've seen him whip guys twice his size. And I thought Tony could be very, very violent. I've seen that. And yeah, he was all of them things. He'll put you away in a minute. He would have put you away in a minute. I and, until at the end. And then he got all of them. He had other people to do it for him. The stories, uh, you know, the lawman will say, yeah, we think he's linked to 25 murders. You think that's no. even realistic? Not 25. Uh, probably, you know, less than half that amount, I would say. The story about the, the head and the vice? That's true. Were you around? Yes, I was a part of that uh, situation. Can you get into that? or? It's part of the, uh, I guess it's part of the record right now. Well, this guy uh, that's head was put in the vice uh, actually had uh, him and another guy killed three people without uh, permission, an okay, let's say, and just happened to be that these two of these brothers were, their father was connected to Tony Ricardo. And uh, it's a no-no, first of all, to do that and second of all, they shouldn't have, these two guys killed some these people in a suburb in Chicago that was highly connected to the syndicate or the outfit, and they did it there. That's another no-no. Were you involved in getting them yes, to the I place was. where it happened? 
Yes, I was. How'd you do? I was actually invited on the on the murder to kill these two brothers. Uh, and that uh, what happened that night was uh, I was uh, with a girl in a bowling alley. I had the guns by my house and a work car that was going to be used in this killing of these two brothers, the Scavo brothers. So anyway, uh, Billy McCarthy, one of the victims, came in the bowling alley and said that tonight was the night, let's go. And I told him, well, I'm over here with this bra. And he said, I said, wait till I'm done. I've been trying to nail her for a long time. Now your guy wants to bother me. So he said, all right, where are you, the guns in the garage? And I said, yeah. He says, all right, we're going to... Jimmy and I will go get the guns in the car. Don't worry about it. We'll take care of it. I said, okay. So they left. And I had told these guys before that, we better get an okay on this. But Billy was mad and Jimmy was mad at these two brothers. And uh, so I left with the girl later on. And we went and got gas in the car out there. And I seen the work car come around the corner. I didn't say nothing to her, but I knew that they were ready because around the corner was the lounge where the two brothers worked. So I uh, got gas and left, went to the motel with the girl. The next day I'm driving her home and I hear it on the news. And I thought to myself, my, that was gonna be a lot of problems. Where'd I kill him at? And right after that, Tony come knocking at my door. The following day, my house, we went down in the basement, him and I, left Dickie Gorman, who was a partner of ours, up on the top, and we sat downstairs and he asked me, because he knew I was working with Billy and Jimmy on the route. And uh, he asked me if I knew anything about it, and I told him no. And he said, well, he says, I'm here because I want to, you're my guy and I want to protect you. He said, uh, "These they think that you were with Billy and Jimmy on the hit. And I said, I don't know enough to hit him. He says, no. He says, I'm going to bring that story back. He says, I can't, you know, he says, I won't be able to go to bat for you. They'll whack you. He says, so, what do you want to do? He says, all you got to do is tell me that they were there. He says, and that's it, you're out of it. He says, it's not like we're turning them into the cops. He says, we got to take care of these guys. These guys are out of line. So I says, all right. And I says, yeah, they were there. I said, you know. So he come back, he said, well, stick around, I'll see you later. Coming back and got me the next night, and he, the next day, and he says, you got to make a phone call. I said, to who? He's the Billy. He said, you got to get him out of the house. Tell him to meet you at the chicken house on North Avenue in, uh, in Melrose Park. He said, tell him you got to score. But don't tell him, you know, just act nonchalant. He said, we just want to talk to him. <laughs> I thought to myself, this guy must think I'm stupid. I know what he wants to do, but I, you know, I got to go along. So I did make the call, and I spoke with Billy's wife, and she put him on the phone, and he said, "Yeah, I'll meet me." And uh, you know, the rest is history. They 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 scooped him up, and then they went after the other guy. Billy resisted a little bit. Billy had a gun on him, but Tony, they took the gun away. There was three three guys there, three guys. Turk, Tortorelli, Joseph Nagal, Nagal, Joe Nagal, Ferriola, and Tony. Ferriola? Ferriola. And uh, Chucky Nicoletti. They were there with Tony when they scooped him up at the chicken house. And uh, I was in the car with Saint, parked in a lot, waiting because Tony used my car to go over there. So when Billy seen my car, he figured it was all right to go into the chicken house. It was, you know, he was entrapped. And then when Tony came back, I was sitting in the car with Saint. Saint pops a gun out, and I'm thinking, but he Saint didn't know I had a gun on me. I figured if this old man pulls his gun, I said, I'm going to whack him before he whacks me. And uh, nothing happened. He, Tony got out, jumped, gave me my car. He said, I'll talk to you later. I'll tell you what happened later. Then he told me what happened later. What's the deal with the vice? Well, they couldn't get the name out of Billy. Out of Jimmy, I mean, out of Billy. They couldn't get the name of his partner, and they, they tortured him. They hit him with ice picks, and so finally they put his head in the vice. Tony said, this is one tough Irishman. He said, let me tell you something. He said, put this Irishman's head in the, in the vice. He says, and I start turning and turning, and he says, and his eye popped out, you know, he says, and it hangs on the cord, he says. And, and then he says, he screamed out Jimmy's name. He says, when he screamed out Jimmy's name, he says, kill me. And he says, and Tony says, I just 
cut his throat. He said, while the old man was eating pasta, he says, he didn't even bother him. He says, and then we went after Jimmy. You and Tony became almost like brothers, didn't you? Oh yeah, we were real tight. We were real close. But Tony had his, you know, he worked for certain guys and so I had my crew, but we were we were very close. We were very close. How does it work that he comes to Las Vegas and how does it work that you come to Las Vegas? Well I'm going to jail and he's coming to Vegas. That's how it worked. I was on my way to the penitentiary for some guy rolled over and he beefed on me about uh, a Brinks truck robbery and uh, and I had a couple other cases going. Did you do the Brinks truck robbery? Oh yeah, it was done. It was a four-year-old crime, you know. And uh, we already spent the money. So <laughs> here's the guy that rolled four years later and I get indicted for it. And uh, I had a couple other truck hijacking, hijacking cases going. So Tony was on his way to Vegas and I was on my way to the penitentiary. And he said, I wish you could join me. He said, but you're on your way to another place. And, I, and he said, but when you get out, he says, uh, I want you to join me out there. And I said, all right. I don't know how much time I'm going to get yet. I said, but, you know, providing it's not too long, I said, yeah, I'll join you. Was he sent there? Yeah. Milwaukee Phil sent him there. On the Regio. Uh, what would the, the what He would was the, order? the watch out for Lefty. Be Lefty's, Lefty's, uh, you know, Lefty could have been out here alone, and then he would have muscled anybody who could have muscled him. But as long as people know that Lefty had power behind him, and you know, they stood away from him. So Tony was out here more or less to be his muscle, you know. And to protect the skim? Oh yeah, to protect, protect the skim, protect the robberies, uh, the dealers that were cheating in the casinos, the, you know, all that shit that goes on in casinos. You know, the, the, the story, the, the, the legend that's evolved is that uh, in the, those days there was no street crime involving mob guys yeah. here. That any killing was done somewhere else. I know where you're going. And, with it's, it. and it's Spilatro who got out of control and brought or, brought the mob into street crime. Well, when Tony brought me out here, he said, "I need you to come out to Vegas." He actually came to. I had a I had a disco, so he came to my disco and he said, "Listen, he said, I need you. I need you in Vegas." He says, "I can't do certain things now because they got me in a black book, or they're going to put me in a black book. I forgot what it was." He said, but I need you to keep an eye on Lefty. He says, he's got another guy that I got chaperoning him around, which I don't want to mention the other guy's name right now, but he had a guy, you know, chaperoning him around. He says, but I need you to keep an eye on Lefty. He says, because uh, the Jew's getting a little nuts. He's getting a big head. He's running around this town thinking he's got it. He says, so uh, he'll know who you are. He says, and everybody in that casino will know who you are. He says, and uh, you got guys that you can bring out here with you? And I said, yeah. He said, are they crazy? He said, oh yeah, I got two of them that are real crazy. He said, bring them out. He said, I don't want to meet them. He said, you know, don't know who I am. I don't want to meet them. I said, okay. So I got my crew and I had my crew come out here. And uh, first thing I did was I introduced myself to the casino manager, and uh, who was Gene Cimarelli. Gene Cimarelli was there. And Gene knew who I was immediately anyway. So. Uh, this opened up the door, and then as the word spread around in the casino, who I was with, and uh, they came to me when they wanted to get messages to Tony and stuff like that. I was the contact guy, and then uh, I told Tony, I said, Tony, I said, you know, I got these guys. We're not giving them paychecks every week like they're they're working for Sears Robux or anywhere. You know, they need to earn. You know, so he says, well, tell them to go on the route. He says, let them go on the route. He says, and you know, I get an end of the score. I said, well, you're not going to get half, you know, if there's four guys, we cut it up five ways. Yeah, he said, that's good, as long as I get an end, you know. He says, and tell them to go up, but don't let them see you giving me the money and tell them, they'll know what's happening. I said, all right. So uh, that's what I did. I put them on the route, and all these guys went out and they muscle bookmakers, burglarized houses, uh, home invasions, armed robberies, everything, murder. The route. The route. We were on the route. So eventually I just stopped going out with them. They knew what they had to do. And I furnished them with the radios, the cars, and the inside tips that I would get for different scores, you know. Murder for hire? Well, no, we didn't. There was none of that for hire. You know. Murder. You just, murder. If need be, yeah. Listener was one of those guys. That's correct. What, what did he do? He was an, he was an undercover informant. Uh, we Tony got word that uh, see I got indicted I was not indicted I was subpoenaed to the grand jury in Washington D.C. over uh, something that Listener had got me involved in and then Tony got the wire that uh, Listener was working with uh, Feds 
or the DEA or something. I don't know who he got the information. I can't remember who he got that information from, and he ordered me to whack him. And when I hesitated a little bit, he says, if you don't do it, I'm going to do it. Says, this guy's got to go. And that was it. When those things are going on, are, are there reports made back to the guys back in Chicago? Or, Supposedly or they're supposed to be. I brought money back. I used to bring money back. The skin money? Uh, other types of money from robberies and stuff. Uh, once he made it clear to some of them that my guys had to make a living, they wanted their money too. So I used to bring envelopes back to uh, like Joe Nadal, Joe Ferriola. I used to bring him envelopes back and uh, and he used to always say, what's going on out there? What the hell's going on out there? You know, and at times it's like we're hearing a lot of crazy things, you know. And I try to run it down to them as smoothly as possible, you know. You think there's any one thing that you point to that where things went to hell? Or yeah. was it a bunch of things? It's one thing actually went to hell. When Tony started thinking with that thing between his legs, and uh, when he nailed the, the Jew's wife, you know. So that's true. Oh, definitely. And uh, definitely true. And uh, when he finally told me, only reason why he told me is because she came in my place wanting to see the little guy. She knew that I was connected with him. I had to sit, sit her down at the lounge next door, and I went by his house and told him, I said, what did you do? I said, she's over there, that lefty's old lady. And he says, you know, he says, I, he says, I screwed up. He says, I nailed her, he says, and he says, and just got a lot of problems now. And then I said, well, the people back at home are gonna hear this shit. He said, well, he says, we gotta lie. And sure enough, they questioned me about it back at home. And I knew that if they ever found out that I was lying, I was gone, just like him. So when the old man asked me, what's going on? Is he nailing the Jews all lady? And I said, no, nah, he's not nailing her. Is you sure? I said, no, what would I, to lie to you? He's nailing her. So Lefty is complaining. Lefty's crying to other people and it's getting back to Chicago. He's not telling them directly in Chicago. But the word gets back, you know, it's a small town. At the town at the time this town was like a fishbowl. You know, I mean now it's big. Then it was nothing. Why would Tony do that? I mean, do you think she was he a, conniving and No, he had a history. That you know <laughs> one thing I knew about Tony, uh, you could only trust him so far when it comes to girls. Because I seen him do it three two hundred times before. The friends, his friends, old ladies. They went to jail, you know, and he'd bring them groceries for a little while, give them a little money, and the next thing you know, he was screwing them. I know two guys for sure that he'd done it to that, you know, wound up being his enemy afterwards, but they couldn't do nothing about it, you know. So this wasn't a thing of her seeking him out for, like, protection? No, kind of. no. So that really, from there, it goes downhill? Yeah, it went downhill, plus Tony, as I said, he, he had a lot of pressure on him. A lot of pressure from the authorities uh, from both parts. You know, even going all the way back to Chicago, and plus the newspaper wasn't. Everybody was on this guy, and uh, it was getting to him. It's where he couldn't even drive a car. He was scared to drive a car for fear that they would pull him over and give him a ticket and run him in. That's why he always had somebody driving him around. And uh, he just was he was losing it. He was losing it. Were well, the drugs involved? I can't rightly say I ever seen Tony do any drugs. I know he was on different types of medication. Uh, he used to say it was for his weight to try to get in his heart. Uh, one time he, we were sitting in the My Place lounge and he pulled out a little bottle like this. He's looking, I found it in between his seats. It was like the little brown bottles that they used to put the Coke in. And I looked at him and I said, where'd you find that? He said, stuffed there in the seat. I said, you sure you didn't get that out of your pocket? Oh, give me that bullshit, something like that. And I laughed and he threw the bottle on the ground. Back up for a second. My place and upper crust. How'd that work? How, how did those businesses come into here? Well, your we were hanging in my place lounge before, you know, the lounge. And then I had this idea of opening up uh, a restaurant. And uh, so we decided to open up a restaurant next to the my place lounge and make a hole in the wall to serve food through the hole in the wall. And which we thought was going to be very good. Actually, it didn't work out as good as we thought it was, as far as serving the food through the window. 
uh, we were doing real good there until the, the cops made it uh, unbearable for us, anybody to come in there and eat. I mean, we had all kind of movie stars used to come in there, but they were scared to come in there after a while, and pit bosses and casino because they didn't want to, you know, lose their licenses and stuff. So well, we the cops would pull them over after a while? Well, they'd pull them over before they even come into Russia. I know one time they pull over a, a guy that's an entertainer out here right now, a real big guy, and they told him, do you know where you're going? Do uh, you know what, who owns that place? And he says, all I know is the food's good in there, and I'm going there to eat. I'm not going in there to socialize with the owners of the place. Famous movie star. He came in there, he sat down, lined up the tables, he ate, and he told us what happened. And he wasn't connected, he was just a customer. Spent good money. So you didn't own my place, it was just a place you hung out? Yeah, it was just a uh, place we hung out in. It was a, it was a place we, were, we felt safe in, that we knew wasn't uh, bugged, because we used to sweep it, you know, for bugs and stuff like all that. All the time? All the time, yeah. All the time. That's why we found that bug in the roof so quick. They never even got it on. Oh, and the ceiling. Never, so they didn't, get any they didn't have a chance to put it on. They just hooked up and we found it the next day. So, no, we were too paranoid. Well, they were watching you. Yeah. Oh, yeah, they were in the bank with binoculars. The girl at the bank come and told us, she says, don't, don't say I told you. She says, I'll lose my job. She said, but they're on the second floor and they're watching you with binoculars. I said, oh. So we knew everything. People just naturally tell you things. Actually, we were liked. <laughs> Well, I was going to say, in a lot of ways, you were like movie stars. Yeah, we were liked. We were liked. We would help. We would help the people more than hurt them. Yeah, we only hurt people that we thought deserved to be hurt, and uh, we never begged anybody to take any money. If they needed money, they come beg you. And as far as robbery, I don't. We never robbed any poor person. Insurance companies paid. You know, so we thought we were doing right. Uh, the gold rush, were you around when, when uh, sure. Francis Quattro owned that place? Sure. Was it just a, a, a fencing operation pretty much? Well, he wouldn't put any hot merchandise in there. Definitely not, because he had so much heat on him. Uh, but uh, he sold jewelry out of there. He didn't do anything. I don't believe he'd done anything illegal in there. It would be stupid of him to do anything illegal in there. Now, the FBI and the locals thought he might be, but... Common sense of tight is where these guys at all the time. It's like running around telling you, hey, look what I got hot stuff. No, he wouldn't do that. Um, let's see. A couple of names. Uh, Tamara Rand, you know who that lady was? Yeah. You know anything about how she was killed? She was shot in the head. You know who did it? Uh, probably have an idea, but, you know, I couldn't actually uh, tell you definitely who it was. You don't want to say? No. Uh, somebody you knew? I would think so. Was there a, do you have any idea why she had to go? Causing, probably causing uh, unnecessary uh, aggravation out here with money, pertaining to money. Uh, lefty, tell me what you thought about him. Lefty. Well, I know Lefty, I, my first meeting with Lefty was probably in early 60 and he was a gambling degenerate along with probably the best odds maker in the world he was had a head as he had a head as big as a barrel I mean he just thought who he was and uh, actually that's about all I could tell you about lefty uh, yeah, that's about all. You know, he never he never did any time for the skim and everything that was going on in there. I often wonder. I mean, well, he probably didn't know anything about the skim. Uh, he didn't. He wasn't put in that situation uh, for the skim. Uh, there was other people that were put in that situation. I didn't have anything to do with the skim either, uh, because that wasn't my what I was supposed to do. There were certain people for them for them jobs. Even Glick, he didn't know nothing about it. Uh, they were happy to get their money. But they didn't know because they were looking the other way? You don't think Well, I'm sure they were looking the other way. I'm sure Lefty was looking the other way. But what he didn't know wouldn't hurt him, see? So he was sure he's going to turn his cheek. If he had nothing to do with that, why was he there? Well, I mean, it was a, he wasn't put there, he just had a job? Oh, he was put there. He was put there for the booking end of the operation, to open up a race book in there. Uh, this guy was great. You see the race book he put up in the yeah. Stardust. I mean, it just... 
And that's all that we needed. Chicago was de always dependent on uh, gambling. That was the main source of money, gambling. Not drugs, gambling. And Lefty was good at it. Um, so no, Lefty wasn't involved. Do you think he turned? That he, uh, he, uh... I don't know. He's still alive. Evidently he didn't. He would have been dead. Of course, he didn't testify. I know, but, well, I don't know about that blowing up of his car. Uh, if they, if he would have never, they, they would have went back and got him again. You know, uh, I know if I went out to get him or any of the people I know went out to get him and missed the first time, you go back and get him again, you know. Well, who, who, did the, who did the car bombing? I don't have any idea. You don't think Tony did the car Oh, no. Tony would have got killed sooner than that if he would have done it. You know, he didn't. I doubt it very seriously. So that would have been off limits for that? That one. was off limits, yeah. That was off. No theory on who did it? Well, they were saying that he had some enemy and uh, some guy had an ally or something. I don't know. I didn't know the, the deal on it. I wasn't around. I was locked up, I think, then. So uh, that's all I could gather by that. But I doubt very seriously if Tony had anything to do with it. He wouldn't have missed if he did. He never missed. So he wouldn't have missed with Lefty. So there are a lot of other ones we don't know about. Oh, I would say. You know the guys, the Hanleys, Tom and Granby Hanley? I don't know them personally. I heard a lot about them. Just, you know, some people talking about them, but I don't know. Bad guys? A little cuckoo, I heard. Cuckoo guys, you know, a little off. It's been portrayed that they did jobs for people, unions, things like that. Maybe. Well, I heard that they did a little jobs for the union and stuff like that. Uh, I've never dealt with them. I don't think they've... Um, I never heard Tony mention their names like they would do anything for him. Uh, I would have heard that. I was that close to him that he would have said, well, I'll have the Hanleys handle it. Or just, never mentioned their names to me. Uh, so i assuming that he never had anything to do with them. Culinary union in those days. You, you refer to it as ours. Ours. It was ours, yeah. Worst thing that people did was when they voted against us. That's what I figured. Voted against us. We had more going for us. We would have done more for the people. Meaning the muscle. muscle. Well, they were protected in their jobs, you know. Now look what happened. They ain't got nothing. They're standing on the street with picket signs all the time. What was in it for you? Well, we'd make money. You know, I mean, there was money in there. We'd get out of there somewhere or another. They'd get it to us. A lot of money. Oh, there's a lot of money in there, yeah. But we weren't depriving the people of any money. The people that were putting money in there. You know, there's a, a fund that goes into, we'd use that money, you know, and just kick it back. They'd make money with our, us taking money out of them. So they weren't losing anything. Do you think, uh, you know, culinary is pretty, they paint themselves as real above board these days. What do you think? I don't know. You know, I think there's probably still a little, there's got to be a little something going on with them. I can't say for sure. Uh, I just don't believe that they could be that far above board, anybody. You know, look at all these politicians. The stronger you are, the more you steal. <laughs> Herbie Blitzstein. Herbie Blitzstein. What about him? Well, I mean, what kind of guy was he? Herbie was uh, sort of a braggadocious guy in his own way. Herbie uh, knew how to make money. He was a Jew that had all the Jews locked up, let me put it like that. He had a connection to the Jews. And you know, the Dagos make money from the Jews. Jews are good money makers. And uh, Herbie was good at jewelry. He was good at booking, you know, book. He had a lot of connections. Uh, you know, he'd been, he's been portrayed as an enforcer. Was he an enforcer? No, absolutely not. Absolutely not. i never seen Herbie raise his hand to anybody. Never. You knew something was going to happen to him, didn't you? Well, Herbie was out here all alone. And uh, he's living off of the past and there's a lot of crazy people running around and he'd walk around with thirty to fifty thousand in his pocket and all that wonderful jewelry on his hand and his neck and I just figured that he was going to get popped sooner or later somebody was going to try to rob him I call that one Saxon Tobin Sax? Hal Saxon, Herb Tobin who were both yeah, I know Hal, I know Sax uh, more than Tobin, Sax is uh, you, know. you know this is after um, Lefty. Af yeah, after Lefty and that era, and these guys are put in, supposedly to clean the place up. Did they, <laughs> no. were they looking the other way? Did they know? Did they looking the other way. Was, yeah, I know sex well. 
Sax originally was from Detroit. So, yeah, I know Sax very well, and sure he turned his cheek. What he was going to do it. He had to turn his cheek. It was still there when he was there. The skim was still there. The corruption was still there. He was put in there for that? Exactly. And he had to know why he was put in there. Well, I'm sure he did, but he wasn't... It wasn't detailed out like uh, you sit in the room and you say, well, this is why you're being put in there. No, he had an idea, and uh, the least he knew, the better off he was, the longer he'd live. What about Mo Dalitz in those days? Mo Dalitz was a man that we respected, that uh, not because he was feared, that he was just a man that you should respect because he uh, done a lot, uh, I would say, uh, in this town. Uh, was he actively involved in anything while you? Not at the time I was out here. He was just a man that we respected. I don't believe he was involved. I never had to worry about him or take any orders or hear any orders coming through him. An uh, elder statesman kind of a thing, or a godfather? I would say no. I would say say like elder statesman. I wouldn't say godfather. Could he have reached out for help? Yes, sure he could have. If somebody threatened them or abused them, he could have reached out for help. Out of respect. I've heard it characterized that, you know, he was bootlegger, he was a, a major guy, and then sort of went straight and then became a victim of extortion, that, that he was more, like, stolen from. Well, I've never heard this story. I'm sure, you know, I'm sure that stories are out there like that. And, uh, you know, as I told you, the Italians always get the Jews. You know, we work good with them. You know, we work good with them. They're good money makers, and uh, we protect them. And uh, they make us money. So, you know, that's the way I look at it, okay? Well, here's another Jewish guy you know, Oscar Goodman. What? Well, Oscar ever your, your lawyer? My buddy, Oscar? <laughs> I'm sure you like to hear this. Yeah, Oscar was uh, co counsel to John Mamet. Uh, so, yes, he was my attorney. He gave me advice. And, uh, yeah, he was my attorney. Any, uh, you know, people have wondered, you know, you got Joe Yablonski's view, Yablonski saying he thinks Oscar was over the line. He did more than what a lawyer should do. Give me your take well, on Oscar. Well, let me, let me give you my take on Oscar. Let me get this out on the table. For once and all, for once and for all with Oscar. Oscar done what he had to do. He was a good attorney for the criminals. He's never going to admit that they were criminals, rightfully so. He's not supposed to. Uh, he's done his job there. Oscar was well aware of what we were doing, I believe. I have sat in this conference room with my guys. He set up his conference room with Tony and them when we discussed cases. Oscar knew what was going on. I mean, but he's a lawyer, you know. I mean, he's lawyer confidentiality. Uh, so he done his job. Uh, as far as, a, uh, a, can I say something? Oscar is a good mayor. This is where it should stay. He's done a lot, I heard. So I will give him credit for that. Lawyer, eh, don't get mad, Oscar, but that's the way I feel. <laughs> uh, does he have anything to fear from you at all? You Absolutely think he has not. To worry about? No. No. What the, I don't see why. I'm not going to hurt him. Well, I mean, I heard Jablonski say something. He intimated that maybe Oscar in meetings suggested taking somebody out or witnesses that needed to go or. Uh, I never heard that. Okay. I never heard that. Right. Uh, let's see. Judge Seymour Brown? I never had that. Yeah, I know he is. I never had that. Wasn't with you guys? Um, you ever have any news reporters? No, I wish we did. No, we didn't. Uh, there were some guys that sometimes would say favorable things, and uh, they were saying the right things, too, when they said favorable things. But then there were some guys that were just... Uh, Police, policemen orientated. I mean, they were honest. Even if we were right, they were honest. You know. Ever hear a story that uh, Sheriff Lamb was uh, was cooperating or took more? <coughs> Sheriff Lamb. Ralph Lamb. Uh, Lamb was not in office when I got out here. He just left the office. I heard he was just a tough. He was a tough uh, sheriff. He gave Tony a lot of headaches at first. Pretty big story about Sheriff Moran. As Moran as a candidate running for sheriff. Um, the story comes out, I think it was from you. It was. That, uh, the money that Tony... 50000 50000 Tony, a uh, guy come in and said, uh, I gave that 50000 uh, to Moran for his the campaign to be sheriff. 
He said, but he wants more. He needs more. And Tony, with a few words, you know, choice words, uh, moaned about it. And he said, well, I'll put in another 30 and that's it. What was the deal supposed to be? Well, I guess if you lock him up with money, he's, you know, you get the sheriff on your side. Sheriff runs the town, we used to. Uh, you got him in your pocket, takes the heat off you. You tell that story, it's a big story in town, isn't it? Oh, my God, they went crazy. They went crazy. You know, it's politics. Politicians, don't, you know, who wants somebody who don't want to get in it, somebody wants to get out of it. Oh, God, it was driving me crazy. Sorry I ever said anything about it. Then, it's Sorry. over now. Yeah, they were driving me nuts. Lawyers didn't want to touch it, you know. Nobody wanted to get involved with the questioning, questioning of it, you know, at the time. They were scared. They got to live in this town. I was leaving, so... The FBI wanted to know about it, didn't they? Oh, yeah, they wanted to know about it. Yeah. All they could, you know. So I told them it was all I, all I could tell them about it, you know, that I was there, heard the conversation, heard Tony tell the guy, you, get, you gave him the 50, okay, and the guy wants more, I'll give him another 30, that's it. He wouldn't be doing this just for show. This is real. No, real. He, he didn't want nobody to know that, you know, yes. other than Moran to know. That he was getting the money. Because Moran swears it's a political dirty trick. It's his, it's McCarthy the sheriff who was making it up. McCarthy the sheriff. Yeah. Well, McCarthy didn't like us either. <laughs> <laughs> in those days, you you told me off camera they're just doing their job. It, it, you you feel that way, or do you feel it it went overboard? The cops were in Las Vegas. Uh huh. I think I think it went a little overboard. I think I think what it got it was a little personal. Uh, like I said, I got no hard feelings with these guys, but sometimes you can't take that shit home with you. And I think they took it home with them, and uh, they got too personal. Uh, it was a bad show with them. In examples, and you don't have to name the names unless you want to. I don't to. think that they should have uh, shot up uh, Tony's brother's house or Tony's house. Uh, I don't think they should have. Uh, I think this kid that was killed uh, was an overreaction on at least one of their parts. I understand them being scared to thinking the guy had a gun, if in fact he had one. I believe he had one. But still, I, you know, I, I could understand them getting nervous and, and shooting, but they emptied the guns out, you know. And uh, the kid was a square guy, although they didn't know that, you know. Shooting at uh, Tony's Tony's house and his brother's house? Uh, I, You know, it's been so long ago. I know one thing for sure. It was done at his brother's house, Johnny's house. When that happened, what was Tony's reaction, your reaction, and the other guys? Well, Tony went nuts. Tony went totally crazy. Tony uh, wanted to go to war with these guys. Then he said, well, he thought about it a moment or two, and he says, you know, he says, uh, let me think and see what we could do with this. He says, i got to get even with these guys. He says, this was out of line. And I, I must say, I agreed it was out of line. So a few days later, he come up to me, and he said, listen, he said, are you still... Are you still socializing, or do you still know the black guys that you were locked up with from, uh, uh, I forgot the name, I can't think of it. Blackstone Rangers. Yeah, the Blackstone Rangers. And I said, uh, yeah, I says, uh, the one guy's name was Thunder Stevens. And I says, yeah, I says, I, I still keep in contact with him. He says, I got a good idea, he said, what we could do. He said, we could start a race right here, have these black guys come out, whack these two coppers like it's in a race right. Start a little eruption with the police. He says, and shoot these two, the two cops. He says, and it'll look like a race right, and get all the heat off of us. Otherwise, he says, if they think we done it, he says, geez, it'll be like World War II, he said, you know. He says, so this is the only way to do it. He says, but let me think about it first. He says, I gotta think about it. I said, well, whenever you're ready, let me know. I said, because these guys will do it in a minute. Yeah. Did that have to? Did that go as far as you or ask Chicago for permission? Well, he would that? have to. He would have to go back there and ask him for permission for that. That was up to him to do. I was relying on his okay. If he said it was all right to me, I take it for granted that the okay already came from Chicago. Somehow the word gets out, and the cops from here go to Chicago. What do you know about that story? Well, I heard that they went up to uh, Joe uh, Joe Lombardo's house and knocked on the door, and supposedly Kent Clifford. Uh, Threaten Joe. That's bullshit. As far as I'm concerned, that's bullshit. Joe Lombardo, first of all, wouldn't talk to the guy, wouldn't say anything. I slammed the door in his face. Wouldn't say anything. He's got nothing to say. Even if the guy's surrounded with Chicago policemen, which I doubt he was, maybe he had one guy that brought him to the house, 
Joe is not going to listen to that bullshit from Kent Clifford. Not in Chicago. Maybe in Vegas, but not in Chicago. You know, one version of it is Kent Clifford <coughs> goes there to ask for, hey, call this off on these guys. Another he, version. He was supposedly he, went there for that. And then supposedly he was supposed to say that if any of my policemen get hurt back there, we'll kill every alpha and get it, walks the face of the earth. This is what I heard from some policemen. That's not going to happen. That's not going to happen, you know. You had a policeman in your in your gang. I mean, uh, Blasco, in yeah. your crew. What do you think about him? <coughs> once a cop, always a cop. You didn't trust him? No, he was once a cop, always a cop. I don't believe in, uh, confiding, in the, confiding in them, whereas Tony used Blasco for certain, certain things, knowledge that he obtained from the police department. Me, I didn't believe any of it because he's a cop. What's a cop? Always a cop. I believe that they were there. That's where they should stay. A crook should stay where he's at. I mean, it's just not right. They called you guys the hole in the wall gang. How'd you like that title? Couldn't stand the name. Thought it was ridiculous. Hole in the wall gang. You think they did it to irritate you? Oh, sure they did it. And they've done a good job because it did it. It aggravated all of us. You get a label. Then every time Dick and Harry on the street was punching holes in the wall, and we were getting the rap for all these scars. <laughs> we should have been all them scars. We'd have been jillionaires. In those days, you were doing pretty well at oh, these Oh, we were doing so great. Right? We were doing great. We made a lot of money. And Bertha's would have been what? Uh, well, in our estimation, we would have made, we would have probably made anywhere from fifty to one hundred thousand apiece. That's what I was estimating by the jeweler in cash that we figured they left in there. It's a family-owned and operated place. With a, with a vault, they could have had all their money in there. You know, we didn't know. I just know that we could get in that vault. And that went downhill because of the informant. Because of that Sal Romano. Yeah. Did, did you have a feeling about this guy? From day one, from day one, when he, when this guy brought him into the crew, and then Tony told me that he, he had the guy put the alarm system in his house. I said, "Are you kidding me? You trust this guy?" And Tony says, "Yes." Uh, Pete brought him. I said, "I don't like this guy. He seems a little." strange to me. He talks a little guarded. And what makes things even worse is a couple of Chicago cops came down from Chicago, meet me in my joint, and told me about Sal Romano. They said, we're going to give you some advice. We busted this guy at O'Hare Airport with furs, minks, stolen from Vegas. The, the government took him, took the case away from us. Nothing's happened. What does that tell you? That tells me that the guy's working undercover, so I went and told Tony. A couple guy, a couple cops, detectives come and told me this. He said, no kidding. He said, I says, and he's already filled in on Bertha's. Now what? Ernie filled him in. I would never fill the guy in for supposedly his alarm expertise. Anybody could do what he done, you know. So to wind up his Tony said, keep your eye on him. Can't. That's not gonna work. So they still went ahead, but they still went ahead with it. Tony went of the money. And then to make it even worse, the Sunday before, I'm in front of Tony's house. It's on the weekend. FBI don't work on the weekends. They, they take off the weekend. <laughs> At least they did then. And I said, Tony, there's an FBI car going around the block there. And he said, yeah, I wonder why they're working on the weekend. This was the weekend before we were going to go do the score. We just had the, the, the scramblers brought by his house. And uh, he says, huh. I said, they're at the sun. So I had all these feelings. So did my other partner in the score, Larry. Lurch, we call him Lurch. No, he went to kill the guy before he went to the score. I said, well, Tony said, keep him with us, watch him. And then Tony fills in that ex cop, Blasco. Another thing I didn't want, you know. But and that's uh, that's where you got nailed. That's where we got nailed. That was the downfall. That night, a uh, pretty pretty bad scene for you. Yeah, it was. It was a it was a bad scene. They came, they were in the air, they were on the ground, they were everywhere. And when Sal Romano disappeared, I knew it was going to happen. I said, where is he, Larry? He says, I don't know, he got away. I said, he got away. They, uh, and then from then on, you see the, the whole in the wall gang, and there's that video, those same shots on television over and over. Over and over. Had to drive. Very depressing. Very depressing, because we were so close and yet so far. And you know, I mean, none of that stuff was going to get fenced there. It was going back. It would have been in Chicago before they even realized that there was a robbery. It was all set up. If Lefty, uh, the prob problems with him is the beginning of the end, was that really? Where, that was the coup de gras right there. That was that. That was it. That was that was it. It was all over. Is that what ends up leading to you uh, becoming a witness? No, no, no. It, what led to me becoming a witness is the feeling, the transcripts I read that Tony was blaming me for everything out here. He said that I, 
he was conveying this message to somebody in the outfit that because uh, they asked him what's going on out there and he said that other guy's lost his mind yeah I can't control him he's robbing and killing people he's referring to me and the guy tells him then you know what you got to do you got to clean your laundry that means he's got to kill me that was it you know I've heard that Tony balked at the idea of killing him that uh, that he you know well it's a you know it would it, it he's the one who initiated the story and I'm sure it bothered him to know that he would have to have me killed. I, he probably would have walked me over to it and had me killed, but I don't know if he would. Well, then again, he may have done it himself. Yeah, so I don't, I don't know that. Hey, shut up, man. We're talking. Great. Good. Good. We'll talk to you later. No, we're trying to do something here, okay? Who is this guy? Does it hurt your feelings kind of a thing? It doesn't hurt your feelings. If Tony's your your buddy since your kids is going to take you out. Sure it hurt my feelings. It hurt me bad. It hurt me bad enough to where I decided to uh, take him out. But I knew what, what, what I was going to do wasn't going to end his life. I knew at least the worst that could happen to him was he was going to get 10 years in jail. He'd do six and he's out. I didn't sentence him to death. He was sentencing me to death. So there's a big difference. So I justified what I'd done. That's my feeling. What, uh, when you heard about him, his end, what did you think about it? His end? Uh, him dying, him being killed, Tony. Well, when I first was told that he was missing by the FBI, they said, uh, they asked me, do you know where he would go? And I said, Tony didn't run, nor his brother. I said, they're dead. He said, how do you know that? I said, first of all, Tony told me he would never run. I said, second of all, I said, I know his brother is not liked back there. I says, and there's probably a problem with his brother. And knowing that Tony has called all, caused all this confusion out in Vegas, they got to wipe them both out. And I call it right. You know who did it? Well, I have the sense that it was uh, guys that are doing the rest of their life in jail now for other crimes relating crimes and, and my uh, sense is that uh, that uh, this guy Rocky and uh, a few of his associates were uh, the ones that were involved in the actual killing. They beat him to death. The, yeah, the way the cops described it, it was pretty bad. They were pretty, well they, they, you know, they, let's put it like this, they held one guy while his brother watched, he was being held and they just beat the one brother to death in front of the, uh, Tony, let's say, and then uh, and then when they went to beat out Tony, I guess his heart went out before anything because he had open heart surgery. And yeah, they beat him to death. And they actually, when you bury somebody like that, as they were buried, you don't want their bodies to show up. So, you know, they thought they buried him right, but it just happened to be that the farmer happened to look in his field. To do it that way, I mean, to beat one and beat the other. I wanted to show them that they weren't tough guys. They knew they were going to kill him. They were just going to make him suffer to death. And that's just what they did. They showed Tony, there's your brother. He's not as tough as he thinks he is. Think about it. Michael was a real wise guy. He used to go around cocky mouth, abusing people. He thought who he was. Despite the fact that Tony had agreed to take you out, how'd you feel when you finally heard it confirmed? I was that not he was happy. Oh, oh, I wasn't happy that he was. You know, I didn't, I didn't want to see him. As bad as I disliked him, I thought it was a terrible way for him to die. You gotta remember, I go back with this guy a long time. The most I wanted to do to him was put him in jail for 10 years, and he was only gonna do six, and that's all he would've got if he would've copped off. After you'd become a witness, do you think that there were any attempts or uh, plans to come and get you? I heard there were, uh, but I don't know how true they were. Uh, I doubt if they could've got me, and I doubt if they'd known they known they could've gotten me. Uh, you almost got to give yourself up to be killed. And uh, I'm just not that stupid. That's why I'm still alive.